Um, so I'd like to start off by saying thank you for Johnny for sorting out the sound issues before I get on. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about some large-scale JavaScript architecture. Um, so for those of you that haven't met me before, I'm the JavaScript architect at Beatgaming. Um, we've built a number of JavaScript applications. We've got an open source framework built on top of Marionette. Um, if you know JS applications, um, large, large client-side MVC apps as well. Um, in my spare time, I'm a core contributor to Marionette JS. Um, so issue triaging, reviewing pull, pull requests and fixing bugs and adding new features. Um, so to start off, we're going to look at what actually is a large scale JavaScript <coughs> application. Some common pitfalls that people make um, when they're building them. Some useful patterns to help you build them successfully and how the big frameworks apply these principles. And then we'll end off with some questions. So what's, what is a large JavaScript application? Do we judge it in lines of code? So over 100,000 lines of code, is that a large app? Is it over X megabytes in size? Is it the loss of files, the complicated directory structure? Is it because it's hard to maintain? I don't think it's any of those. Um, I think it's probably a lot, a lot of it all muddled together. But Adi Osmani um, has come up and said that a large application is something that's non-trivial and requires a lot of effort to maintain. And the key point for me is where most of the data manipulation takes place in the browser. So you could have a large file, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, but all you're doing is reading data from an API, displaying it on the page. There's not a lot of complexity there. So you're just rinsing and repeating all the time. What makes it complicated is that you're doing a lot of data manipulation client side. If the server handles that for you, then you've got some really considerate server side devs. Luckily, I don't really have those. Um, so we end up having a lot of data manipulation in the client. First thing people do when they're building the large applications, they look to modularize their app. So they break the large application up into smaller little chunks, thinking of logical components, and the way I tend to think of it is looking at different sections of the screen. So there I've done, if you imagine Gmail, you've got a search at the top, you've got your messages on the right, then menu, and then chat on the left-hand side. So each one of those could be a module in your application. So when you're building, when you're building modular applications, I always find asking yourself four questions. Can you reuse the modules? Will the application still function if one of those modules breaks? Is it easily testable? And does it depend on anything else? So do any of your modules depend on other modules in your app? Some of the common pitfalls that you'll find when you're breaking your application up, you couple your modules too tightly. You end up with a spider's web of events going between all your modules. Lack of testing. And there's your little pitfall man. Hopefully, by the end of this, you'll be swinging over the pit, not falling into it. So tight coupling. What is tight coupling? Your modules end up depending on each other. What will happen then if one of your modules breaks? All of the modules that depend on it will probably also break. Would you be able to reuse it if it's tightly coupled? No, nope, probably not. Can you test it? No, because if you're testing one module, You've got to then test the other one as well because it all, they're all dependent on each other. So you've got tight coupling. It's a bad idea. Listen to the cat. Event webs. So I've seen this sometimes in some applications. So if you imagine Gmail, you've got the messages component. Send a message to the menu to say update my own red. And then actually your menu sends something back saying, right, I've clicked on inbox, I want to show my messages. Um, your search might talk to messages saying, right, I've searched for this. Your messages might come back saying, right, I've displayed, and vice versa. That is a bad idea because you're introducing dependencies on all the modules. This often gets caused by tight coupling. Modules fire the events between each other. It becomes really difficult to debug because it's hard to trace where issues are coming from because it could be in any one of those modules that communicates with the module they're trying to test. 
and it's untestable. Let's clean up those cobwebs. It's time to loosen up your modules. So loosely coupled modules are the key to building large scale apps. You can reuse them. They don't depend on each other. And they're easy to test. How do we go and create them? You have meant something called a facade. I'll go into all this a bit in a bit in a bit. And you create a mediator. You create these two things, you'll end up as loose as this guy. Um, facade. So what is a facade? So you can see there I've put a layer in between all of the modules. So you can see all the, all the modules now are communicating with this facade. And the facade talks back. So if menu wants to talk to messages, send something up. The facade processes that and sends something down to messages. Abstracts the complexity away. Exposes a simple interface. So the facade just has two, two functions on the API, request and reply. See? And bind trigger, different example. So modules only communicate with this facade. The mediator adds an extra layer on top of the facade. So what the mediator does is it's the brains of your application. I often find myself combining the facade and the mediator into one module. So you can imagine that diagram at the, at the start where all the modules were communicating with each other. They'd all communicate with a central, a central module, and that central module would spawn off events to all the other ones. Performs the ap application specific actions based on the events. What this does is, so you've got messages component. If you wanted to take that into another application, there's no app specific logic there. That component is dumb. The brains of the application belongs in this mediator. So that controls what events get sent when to that app module. It controls what the facade listens to. So in some applications, the facade might not be interested in knowing when you've read a message. So it just switches that event off. It controls what the facade sends where, just as I explained before. What is the result? Modules can break without breaking the full application. So if your messages module breaks, doesn't matter. It's just not communicating with the facade. The application won't fall over because there's not a tight, tight coupling in there. Modules can be tested independently. So you can take that one module, write tests for it individually, which means you've got a fully testable component. You can reuse them in other apps, so you can take them out. All you need to do is hook up the events with a new facade and mediator, and you've got that module included in your application. Borat loves it. So just touch on briefly, I mean, we, we probably all use a JavaScript framework. Anyone that's writing complex apps will use some, a different framework. I'm going to try and cover how four of the main frameworks cover this. So we'll start with Marionette. No idea why, just the first one that came to my mind. Um, we've got something called Backbone Radio. Um, Backbone Radio has channels, so you tune into a channel. You can send messages across the channel, and the channel will reply to you. <coughs> so the facade listens to all the modules, channels, and then passes events down to the specific module channels that it wants. We have services, and you can use, use vanilla classes to control it. React has something called Flux. I'm guessing if you use React, you've probably used Flux as well. Um, they've got actions and dispatches, and obviously uh, components. The components are your modules, and Flux controls the facade media. There and there. Angular, um, probably all changes in Angular 2, as Johnny was explaining earlier, but you've got directives, services, and two way data binding, data binding between your models and views. Ember, I know absolutely nothing about Ember. I read the docs before I came in here. Um, you've got components, actions, and you've got routes and controllers as well. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. We'll finish off with some questions. Oh. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.